grab a seat and get going. Um, so welcome to Little Forest Garden. We're going to be talking about citrus today. And um, it's a lot to cover because there's so many different types of citrus. Uh, and there's new ones being introduced every year now. Um, but this is entitled Permac it's the citrus in the permaculture garden. So we're going to be paying particular attention to gills and use in, in permaculture. Right. So we'll cover that a bit later. Right. With any of the citrus, it's important to know when we're talking about any flowers in the garden, typically what we, in permaculture we do what we we do an analysis. We hold, we, for example, if we have a lemon tree, here's our lemon tree. Right? And we determine if we're going to be able to grow that, how we're going to grow that. So that's what they call an element. Right? And this is just a standard sort of way we look at different things in permaculture. We take it apart, we have a look at it. So that's our, that's our lemon tree. What does a lemon tree need to grow? Water. Water? Water. Yeah. So it needs water. What else does a lemon tree need to grow? Sunshine. Sunshine, yep. Soil. Soil. You're talking about dirt or soil? <laughs> soil. Right, okay. Soil, okay. What else? Food. Food. Yeah. 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 What was that? Sorry. Food. Food. Okay, so we're going to call that fertiliser, we're going to call that nutrient. Yep, nutrients. So nutrients, what else is it then? Who knows boys having parties? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that goes into nutrients. Yeah, okay, we can talk about um, available nutrients later. So that's, uh, uh, yeah, okay, we'll cover that down the track because I've got, you know, four. Pollinators. Pollinators. Right, so we call typically we look at bees, don't we? Did anybody see um, um, gardening tray last night? Mm -hmm. The guy talked about uh, one of the entomologists oh, yeah. talked about flies. Flies. Oh, yeah. right. flies are really, really good pollinator. A lot of events, a lot of um, uh, things that affect your pollinator by flies, not just bees. There's a whole section up there, which is it's another whole seminar on that. What else is a uh, what else does our lemon tree do? Love. Love. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How can we define love in a in a in a plant world? Oh, we give it everything we Okay, we'll put down one. Okay, so it needs love and nurturing. And what else does it need in a physical form? Because okay. okay, we want to go and talk to our plants. Shelter from strong winds. What's that? Shelter from strong winds. I'd say protection. Yeah. Protection from. Um, so it wants the right climate, really, doesn't it? Yes. And we really want the climate. What else does the need protection from? Pests. Pests. Can we call possums? Yeah, pests. Alright. Door wasps. Door wasps. Okay, so, so um, insect. Alright. How are we going to How are we going to maintain some of that some of that protection? What's another way we can do that? Would we need rats. beneficial insects? Bloody rats. I like eating all the peel off my lemons. So okay, beneficial insects. Right. Is that sort of covering it? Is there anything else that there might be? Pollination, we've still got bees and flies. Pollination. What about just space? Yep. It needs space. Right. It's because that can determine what size citrus you're going to be able to grow in that area. Needs a clear space under as well, doesn't it? For, for the root, the feeder roots. They no grass. Yeah, there, so, it? so um, yeah, competition. Yeah, lack of, lack of competition. Yeah, no competition. Okay. Um, we can sort of cover a little bit of that with, with, with nutrients if you like. What else? <coughs> um, ah, what else? What about mulch looking after the soil? <coughs> So it's, it, is that pretty well comprehensive what we know? Mm. Right. 
Now let's, now let's try the first one, which is the most obvious one, climate. The analysis of that probably usually goes back to where do citrus come from, typically. Where do they grow naturally? Where do you find them in abundance in their natural habitat? Because if you determine that, you can then go, okay, well, that's what they need. That's closer to the original. Um, the original citruses came actually from from Asia, India, and of course Australia. Because we have how many different varieties of citrus do we have in Australia? Five. There are five species in Australia. Perhaps six. But we've got five different native cultivars. In fact, we almost made the same mistake that we did with the macadamia. Yeah. In 1911, um, seed from our native citrus was taken to America and they developed a hybrid by crossing it with a mandarin and a finger line and they produced offspring. And I don't know if anybody knows the history of macadamia, but pretty much they all went to, or the best ones went to um, Hawaii. And the Hawaiians now regard the macadamia as somewhat their natural plant, where of course it's an Australian species. Fortunately, those cultivars actually came back to Australia when the CSIRO in recent time, in the 90s, started working on hybridising all our different species with the existing species of, of citrus and got a lot of different cultivars. Uh, the finger limes and their types, they're probably close to 30 different types now, and a lot of them being commercially grown as well, so they're quite popular. Um, there's about 20 species of um, citrus worldwide, but most of our varieties come from three main types, um, like the lemons and all those, typically come from the first type. The first, the, they were in, in China is where they really came from. The, the first manuscript which mentions citrus was in 1178 AD in China, and that time they had 27 cultivars of different types of mandarin. In China, so it's got a long history of civilized of of use. So, so that's helpful to know that they need that sort of tropical environment, or that semi-tropical environment. They need a lot of sunshine to do really, really well. Um, we're talking about the different types of citrus too, because there's a lot to do with that. That's our analysis of, say, a lemon tree. What happens if we wanted to grow an orange tree? Well, oranges are actually not naturally They're a cross between the tangerine and the palmetto. They're two totally different types. And the original oranges actually came from, um, were basically brought in by. Um, Oh, uh, yeah, cross with the camps from the, the Arabs. The Arabs were the first ones to bring um, orange or hybridise oranges and bring them into Spain. That's where we've got here. You've got Seville orange, which is, a, which is a, um, and then we have from that we had the development of the sweet oranges. There's a lot of history in this one. Um, now, the Washington label, all right. That's got a really interesting history. That actually came from Brazil, originally, the Washington Navy, and was taken to Washington. And the original plant is actually still growing. It was a, spon it was a spontaneous mutation. If anybody said a look at the Washington Navy, you got that? Uh, that's actually another orange, which hasn't developed completely. And they're looking at that little what? That little. Label in there. And the original one was grown in 1870. Right. And they've made their way to Australia. Uh, got to Australia in 1880. So we've been growing Washington labels in the country for a very long time. Um, and they're the first orange to ripen. Why do we need to know that? Because we want to have, a, if you're going to grow citrus, we want to have a few varieties. So they're the first one. The other commonly one grown is a Valencia. 
Everybody knows the Valencia, typically a smaller orange than the Nobles. Right. Um, and they got here in to Victoria, their first crop was grown in 18, uh, 1890s. It was the first Valencia orchard. Right. So again, we've got a lot of history going back to this one. Um, with the Valencia orange, they tend to hang on the tree longer, so they have a longer season. So you could start with your Washington, and then go into your Valencia. The Valencia is probably the most popular orange. It's grown over a longer period of time. It's the one that's used for juice. So it's a huge industry, the Valencia orange industry. Um, they do have an alternative, alternative bearing though. You know, you've got a big crop one year, and a smaller crop the next year. Right. Very, again, very interesting to uh, now, the Valencias, the Valencia orange, I'll just bring this up for you. Because we tend to, we talk about the superfoods a lot. You know, super berries, wonder berries, all this sort of thing. Oranges in particular, all right? Uh, Valencia's are higher in phytonutrients than your naval oranges. It's very high in phytonutrients. Um, there's about 170 compounds that are the phyto, uh, phytonutrient compounds in a Valencia orange. Right. And we just, we don't pay any attention to those older foods. Right. Um, of course, vitamin C is just one of them, those compounds. But, um, oranges are anti-inflammatory, so they're very good for asthma, they're very good for osteoarthritis, they're all good for those inflammatory diseases as well. Right. Um, really good for the immune system, uh, good for brain function. There's been a lot of work on orange juice and Alzheimer's disease and all those sorts of things. Yeah. Just orange juice, unbelievable stuff. Um, Anti-cancer compounds, also calcium and potassium. In addition to that, they have another 60 flavonoids, right, which are also very important nutrient builders. Now, the bad side, the thing that we don't talk about, is it's not always in the juice. In your orange, when you peel your orange, you have that white and you have the white stuff, a lot of the nutrients are actually in that. Right? So if you want to get the full benefits of your orange, that's why when you if you juice your own oranges, far better because you're going to get some of that material. And that's what we're going to do. So there's all different types. You've got to get that. And then you have uh, blood oranges. The blood oranges are even higher in phytonutrients than the normal oranges again. Who's tried to grow a blood orange locally? How's it gone? Oh, not too bad. They're not as dark on the inside as some of the other ones I've seen around the place, yeah. No, they, they tend to... Blood oranges, you can grow them beautifully, but you won't get the full benefits in our climate because they need higher temperatures and then, and then cool nights mm. and then you'll get the real red. Mm. There's a couple of varieties though that will produce more. Mm. They're producing more, uh, a mm. lot of uh, chicken and juice and out in more Melbourne style. Mm. So they're, but they're really high in, uh, in high in, in phytonutrients and we've, we've got a variety called Arnold's blood, which is particularly good. Uh, and it'll grow beautifully down here. Uh, there's another one called Karakara, uh, which is a sport of the Washington label. And um, that's not too bad, but the other, the best one is the Arnold. It seems to be the better one. Um, then you have, I mentioned the Seville orange. Right? That's what they call a bitter orange. Right? That's mainly used for marmalade and perfume and those sorts of things. So it's not commonly grown, but it's the best marmalade. Um, there's another variety of orange which we get bergamot from. And the bergamot and the tea, that's an orange. Right? It's extracted from the orange. And then there's a whole stack of other varieties that have been crossed with oranges like pangillos and tamarinds and all those sorts of things. Um, now, unfortunately, the 
humble orange is somewhat tricky, and they do it to all the other ones as well. You heard of the process called degreening. Anybody familiar with that? It's very good for the nasty. Um, to degreen your orange, what they typically uh, do in the to get your supermarket orange ready for you. Um, They'll pick them and you can see they're slightly green. So they mm. pick them when they're quite green. And so if you have an orange tree yourself and you're picking your orange straight off the tree, it's developed all the sugars, all the phytonutrients, all those beautiful, wonderful chemicals that have been developed. So if you pick your, you pick your orange green, that's what they typically do in the supermarket or for the supermarket. They have put them under gas, so they call them the greening. So they get they put um, ethanine gas on these guys and they turn, it doesn't ripen the orange internally, so it remains the same, but it actually yellow, oh, orange is up to orange on the outside. Right? <laughs> so you're not that why the modern oranges, typically you won't get the full nutrient benefits, unfortunately, of your supermarket oranges. Is that the same for bananas? That gas is... Yeah, absolutely, because they have, um, if you grow bananas on your tree yourself, I've done in Lillydale, no problem. They're sweet and they've produced all the sugars. And so when you've got anything that produces all those sugars, you're going to have the full nutrient benefit and the flavour oils and all those things are intact. But when we, for convenience, um, because oranges are available all year round, of course, which they're not, because they need to grow on a tree, you know? Um, and same with all the other fruits. So that's unfortunate. The other unfortunate thing they do with oranges is they um, dip them in 2,4-D <gasps> as well, uh, which is a red site. Um, in Common Garden, you'll get, you can go to Mr. Bunnings and buy a, a wheat killer called 2,4-D. Fairly common. Why do they do that? Um, they do that because if they do that, the little native, if they, once, if this is picked green, depending on how green this is, um, and they'll put the, put the gas, that will, that can turn brown in there. If you dip them in the, in the, um, if you dip them or spray them with the chemical with 2,4-D, that doesn't go brown. It actually can go, it stays like more, a lot more orange. Um, yes, unfortunate, very unfortunate. Um, and then you've got the pesticide use and things like that. You've got, yeah, it's typically, the outside of these guys, and or some of the inside as well, residues 16 to 57 percent pesticide residues on oranges and tangerines and citrus in general, just to get them to the supermarket. So we're paying a real high price to where I sit for an orange these days, um, and it's it's just part of the manufacturing process, which is not talked about. It's hot, and they spray 2,4-D also on the plant to drop some of the fruit so you'll get bigger 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 size fruit because it will force some of the small little ones to drop off as well so the grow your own is the best one is grow your own um so yeah because you would think well that looks pretty damn yummy right now this particular one comes from um california right? I don't know what you need to think about that, but it comes from California. Um, and yeah, it's actually a higher price than the Australian oranges. I just went and bought them this morning, and it was actually about, ooh, about a dollar more per kilo from the overseas ones. So there's no real advantage in buying overseas stuff at all. And the American ones, they do, they've got a whole stack of other listing of chemicals that they do to their ones over there that we actually don't do. But, sorry for the bad news. Any questions on that? What do people think about that? I don't want to taste it now. Huh? I don't want to taste it now. <laughs> you don't want to taste it? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think yeah, you should be growing their own. Yeah, and, there's, and there's a whole, you can really go into the, into the nitty gritty on that side of the production cycle. Um, and that's not just oranges, of course, that's all kinds of things. We all know about apples, but yeah, um, oranges, mandarins, the whole lot, depending on what they are, definitely oranges. Um, so yeah, it's a great range.
Um, because it makes a little vitamin pill. Now lemons, which is lemons are probably the most common. There's three main varieties of lemon. There's Lisbon, Eureka. John, I've just got a question. Yeah. I planted either a Lisbon or a Eureka a few years ago, and the label's fallen off. Yeah. And I know it's either a Lisbon or Eureka. Any how tips on how I can tell what it actually was? Yeah. Okay, that's yeah, that's, <laughs> that's fairly simple. Right. Oh, good. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> now Lisbon typically has thorns. Okay, so you right. <laughs> Eureka is pretty well thornless. Okay. Alright, that's really the difference. Eurekas um, tend to be more ever-bearing overall. What does ever-bearing mean? It means they should produce fruit for a very long period. Very much so. Um, Lisbon can do two. They tend to get... Lisbon uh, in time tends to be a very much larger fruit. You know, actually, I've had plants that have been 10 years on plus and they tend to get massive growth. They almost will be seen to almost be reversed to some of their ancient Of course, they're all grafted to the graft Usually, lemons are grafted onto propolia, for instance, which is the cedrous cousin of the citrus. They're grafted onto the most particular ground. This is a Maya lemon. Very thin skinned, alright. Um, it's a bit bigger than that. Whereas the other two, the Lisbon and Eureka, are what I would call a lemon lemon. So it's one you use to possess, all those things like that. Um, so if you want the full nutrient value on your homegrown oranges and lemons, too, possess is the real key. So just in a um, a teaspoon, I reckon a teaspoon of this every now and then to get all that photonutrients to it. It's actually a lot of nutrients in the skin itself. So. Um, you can use that in a, um, you know, for the salad, that type of thing. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Is the Maya thornless or thorns? Maya virtually thornless. You can see it has, this one has, has got sun. This one's been, this is a dwarf one. This is, Grafted on the flying dragon rootstock, which is a dwarf variety of rootstock. Uh, it doesn't dwarf the fruit, as you can see, it just dwarfs the plant. And that's typically what you find. It's a little bit more expensive. There's only one supplier of flying dragon rootstock in Australia, and so you have to get it from one supplier. He has, they do, I don't know if he's there, they have the monopoly on that, so they come out at a higher price. That's why it passes on to the next one. You've got to find typically um, a dwarf root stock's typically ten dollars more than an, an average plant, and that's the reason. John, for the Eureka and the Lisbon, is it, is it common to have a really thick skin, or is that a, a, a problem with the fruit? As, as the Lisbon gets older, the thing gets the skin gets tends to get thicker in particular. Mm -hmm. I don't know about Eureka, but I suspect so. They can get real thick yeah. uh, down the track. Um, and, and particularly, just, yeah, that's a problem with the lupin. There's a whole stack of new cultivars coming out. So this original sort of thornless thorn thing is pretty well going to disappear. You might be able to tell the difference pretty much, except in the actual fruit itself. Typically, the lupin's got a little bit of a nipple on the end of the fruit. Uh, more urgent, it's typically a little bit more grounded overall. But they're a lemon lemon. They're lemon if you want that lemon classic lemon flavor. The other one you get is lemonade. Who's seen those ones around? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Lemonade is a cross between a Maya, Yaha, and a lemon and an orange. Whereas a um, the Maya, um, actually Maya's originally came from China. Uh, they were actually imported by Mr. Maya. That's the name. Um, into Australia in oh, um, fairly recently, like the 1810 around there. Um, 
the Lisbon, the Lisbon comes from, it's a, it comes directly from Portugal, mm -hmm. they've got here about the 1800s, mm -hmm. and the Eureka was developed pretty much in Australia. Funny enough, Eureka, there you go. Now the, the lemonade very, is typically a smaller plant and a lot sweeter because its progeny is orange and, and lemon, so. Yeah. Are you all ripen around the same time, John? Um, typically, um, Lisbon's first, on memory. No, sorry, um, Eureka's pretty well all year round. Yeah. Lisbon's typically winter, so it's a major crop now. But the Lisbon one, mm. it has a smaller one in summer. Yeah. And then the Maya, yeah, typically almost all year round on those ones. Yeah. Again, vitamin C, antioxidants, anti-cancer. Um, um, like so much so that the, the anti-cancer compounds are only second to um, cranberries. So they're really high in all that sort of stuff. Um, and if you want to increase the nutrient content of your green tea, Put a little bit of lemon in it, and it'll double the, the nutrient content and, the, and, and all those different stuff in the tea. Right. Now there's a whole stack of other varieties of lemon, which are now, if anybody comes across them, I'd be very interested, because they're the old refrain varieties. I'll just give you a couple of names here. Right. <coughs> These are the ones we're missing. Are they lost? They are lost. Ooh. These were all in the catalogues in 1936. Uh, so there's possible still plants of these around. Um, so if you come across anything you can't ID, it could be the long lost variety of, of lemon. So there's four there that we're missing. You can also get the variegated one, which we have got. But it'd be good to get some of the original Australian varieties. So, put the word out. So, yeah, there's quite a few. We find this typically with so many different things. They look very different to the um, common. I would imagine they do. Uh, particularly the white. But we don't know. White skin? Yeah, we can have a white skin. So, mm. again, yeah, we can, I can, in the catalogue, you can say. I'm a member of the um, uh, what's called the Plant Trust, and that that was set up an organisation set up by the Botanical Gardens, and they had a look at all the old nursery catalogues and catalogued them and, and were digitised, you know, and finding out what varieties were actually lost in horticulture, and those ones are the ones we can't find. Quick citrus in this case, uh, lemon. Yep. Can one graft variety on one? on one tree, on one uh, plant? You, you can graft multiple varieties onto, uh, onto, onto, onto the tree, so it isn't possible. Right here in Lisbon, on one tree? And yeah, you yeah. can certainly do that. But is Depending the plant on... Depending on, um, some of them, um, some of the rootstocks don't like certain things, like yeah. uh, you can't use trifoliate rootstock, uh, which is a common one we use for, for um, um, the, um, Imperial mandarins. They just they won't fit this. No, won't, won't, doesn't work. For whatever reason. So, so it doesn't there's a lot of yeah, a lot of information on that. Recommend this book. Okay. All right. With a little bit more in depth stuff. Particularly good. Um, Alan Gilbert, who's sadly now he's been prolific in his in books on all kinds of fruit trees. Sadly passed away last year. A great, yeah, great loss to the industry. Um, but yeah, that's a really good book. Everybody wants to go down that track. Um, have limes and lemons got a little bit mixed up. Um, like my daughter has a lime, just this is a lime, it looks like a lemon to me. Uh -huh. Tastes sort of. Thank like you for the segue. Limes. Limes are totally different. I was going to take this. Oh, Limes are actually completely different to lemons. Um, they, they're a cross between a two almost unknown 
one unknown truth now, you can't feel when you find it. Um, they're a cross between a citron oh. Oh. and another. <laughs> Hella. Say that again. <laughs> yep, that's a thick, it's an old, if you Google it, you'll find it, it will come up, it's a really big looking um, citrus like that. Huge. Really? Like this thing with a quick skin? Yeah, we're good. We've had one grow that I left a sip in. Uh, that could be, that could be different again, because that's more than likely, that would be the, um, what a pomelo. Uh, the pomelo hybrid. Camillo is more of a like All the Asians used to come to our school because we lived there and sit there and we asked them what it was and they said what it was. Well the, the original ones of those and the original the original citrons and things they actually went to um they're used in Jewish celebrations, yeah. Passover and all kinds of things there. If they were sacred things, they actually went to um Palestine and River. So yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah. But of course it's getting really weird now because it's hard, we're finding it hard you have to almost have a go down and find the roots of these things. Now the main one you'll come across is the Tahitian. Which is one over there. Growing. And these are lines. The yellow when they're fully ripe. And they're, yeah, when they're fully ripe. They're like, they're like a lemon, they look like a lemon. Very different, um, you can smell them, you can smell the lime. That's the easiest way to tell the difference. But yeah, they actually go, yeah, you can use them when they're greener, but that's, that's completely right now. My next door neighbour has a stall at the front of her place and she sometimes has terrible trouble selling her limes because people accuse her of selling lemons as limes. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. That, that's how they should go. Um, the Tahitian one's a lot more cold tolerant, so you can grow one of those, no problem at all. The West Indian one, that's typically green and yellow, right? and it's smaller. But it needs, they, they're the ones you'll get imported from up north because we can't really grow them here. We need, they need a higher temperature to grow here. They're not cross tolerant. They be, yeah, they do that. West India, they do that. Yeah, they're, 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 they're a lot, they're a lot, lot rounder. Yeah, they're, 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 quite, they're quite spherical. So they're a bit more of And they're, they're the classic. There's a, Again, there's a whole set of more ones coming on, but that's the basic difference. So the other known difference between the Hitchin one is the Persian one, as they indicate, mm. it comes from Persia, mm. so that sort of region. Um, does that sort of help? Can you answer that question? Yeah, I think yeah. you got to cut it and taste it. Yeah, you got to. Or you can, like I say, you, you can, can smell, smell it. it. You can just, smell you can smell it. Yeah, just sketch it. You can, you can really smell the line that comes out. And would the leaves smell like lime too? Yeah. Yeah, whenever we get them in the nursery and we lose the tags, we just do a scratch and sniff test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the crush and fill test. Um, now, of course, there is another one, which is this one here. This is a Rangor lime or Mandarin lime. Just to confuse you. And it, it goes more orange. All right, that's a completely different hybrid again. Typically a smaller growing plant, um, and that produces um, that can be used as a lemon or a lime, typically in its flavouring, but it actually is orange when it's when it fully fixed. But it's only small, too, that's so big. So they're more sour than the typical like, Tahitian ones? Yeah. 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 And would they grow around here? Or they yeah, no, they're they extremely cold tolerant. Um, they're often used as roots as rootstock for some of the uh, mandarins. Okay. So they're quite good. Um, they're spiky a little bit, they're often grown in tubs. <laughs> Um, but yeah, really pretty little things. But that's um, the fruit that comes on the kappa. On the kappa? Like, like this one, yeah. What I prepared earlier. Yeah. We are, that one. Do you eat the fruit? No. No, you can't eat the fruit. You can use it possessed, which is a good idea. Yeah. Um, but no, you don't eat it. No. Right. It's just the one. 
And there's another one um, in the lime sort of family which is called a lime quat as well, um, which is more related to the cross between a lime and a kumquat or calamendron. Um, and that was, uh, and it's a, yeah, for the, a lot of these plants people haven't heard of, so well, that one was produced in 1909. It's been around for a very long time. Uh, no one's ever heard of it. I had I had one here last year, and you and like all your cum pots and those sorts of things, uh, you actually eat the entire fruit. Because if, who's tried who's who's eaten a cum pot and bothered peeling it? Yeah, don't just eat the whole thing because you get the the, the actual skin quite sweet. And it it actually it, um, it works beautifully with the sound and sort of the of fruit. Um, so lime quats, um, got um, your normal kumquat. That's a Nagami kumquat, right? They're um, <coughs> typically flavoured by the Asians and typically the Chinese. Love Nagamis, and their fruits a bit more like that. A bit sort of a bit more. More like that. Quite, um, quite, um, whereas the other sun pots are quite super. So you can eat them straight off the tree. Um, what else can you do with a cum pot? Put them in brandy. Brandy. Everybody does some brandy, one. <laughs> <laughs> the best one. Um, but you can also use them as a fruit in their own right. But um, yeah, not many people. And Mexicans marmalade. Uh, it's typically people used for that. Um, and look, they're highly, I mean, really tough. There's another plant which is related to those. Who's heard of the calamendon? Calamondo. Calamondo. Yeah. You've seen them over there? Yeah. Basically the exact same as the Kung Pot, but quite, they're, they're quite different. They were actually come out from their Chinese plants that came over. Um, you use them basically the same way, but they're not as good as the Kung Pot. You can't eat them straight off the tree. So they're pretty well ornamental. Um, so I don't know if I'd waste my time. John, are they, are they basically a type of cum pot? They're, they? Yeah, related. They're related. They're related, but they're okay. actually not technically a cum pot. Okay. Um, the other ones definitely are. Right. And the other one of citrus, of course, we're missing <coughs> the uh, red fruit. Who eats grapefruit? Mm -hmm. Stupid. They're fantastic. Why are they called grapefruit? Because they hang in big bunches. <laughs> big bunches. That's the only reason we can work it out. Um, and another name for them is shadrocks. Um, the shadrock. Um, there's two main ones. There's a weenie. It's a funny for a plant for a fruit that's that big, it's not exactly weenie, it comes from Weenie's Creek. It's an Australian cultivar. That's why it's called the weenie. And the other one's Marsh's seedless. Or Marsh's. Which was bred by a guy called Marsh from America. And that's why he's, he's got the name in that one. Because Marsh is pretty well seedless. It's not a bad variety. But now there's um, um, there's a whole set of red grape fruit. Uh, so you've got Thompson's, which is a pink, Ruby, which is a red, which is common now. Um, all different types of ones. Again, extremely high in antioxidants. Really, really high. Yep. I've got an old grapefruit tree that I didn't plant there, and I don't know whether it's a weenie or a marsh. Is any tips on telling? Um, both are both are pretty much sold almost opposite, but they're. Um, the weenie's typically smaller and the marsh is bigger and a bit more oval. It has slightly thicker flesh. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's basically the difference there. Okay. Yeah. The weaning of and seeds? Vir and virtually no. Um, the seed count's completely different. Oh. Weaning's got a lot of seed, marsh has got nothing. Oh, I think it's a weaning, okay. Yeah. Um, typically they do better in the warmer um, areas than ours. You get a better, they're, they're a lot sweeter in a warm, more, yeah. um, warmer climate than down here. Yeah. Not, uh, otherwise, they're pretty good for uh, yeah, um, turning into marmalade. And here we go, and then capillon is the other one that is quite, becoming quite common, which of course you use for the leaf. Right. It's quite a good one. Pass that around, have a small bit of a box. If you can smell that, smell the lime and that. Big one. And then you've got to do native or your different native finger limes and all those, which I've got a couple of them here. Who's grown finger limes? Killed mm. one. Really? Killed <laughs> one, yeah. They're yeah, tough. me too. <laughs> They're usually very tough. Yeah. Um, very spiky though. They very do need some water. water. Yeah, it's very, very spiky. Uh, now, are they supposed to all grow up like that? Because I've got one that's about four years old, but that one's about that high. Depends on the variety. Some of them are quite small. Do you know the variety? No, I don't. Okay. Um, yeah, I could get, I could say there's probably about, there's close to 20 different hybrids now. I think oh, like. yes. Um and they produce fruit from that size to this sort of size and all different colours, greens, reds, pinks, um, yeah, fantastic plants. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, typical, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Like, almost like caviar, they use them in, you know, the, the chefs go, yeah. go a bundle on them because you can, once you cut them they explode, they sort of pop and you can just push all the, all the segments out because the segments don't shatter, so they stay intact, so they look, look a bit like caviar and they can use them accordingly. I use them for drinks, those sorts of things, um, but really, yeah. it's not, not really fruity. A real burst of flavour when you pop them. Yeah, real burst of flavour. Yeah, real. Yeah, yeah. Real. yeah. How abundant are they in terms of the quantity of fruits that you get on it? Um, I have plant this high by that wide. Um, 50, okay. easy. Okay. Easy 50 fruit. Um, typically the easiest way to harvest them is wait until they all fall off. Okay. <laughs> get, them, get them all on the ground. A lot easier to try to pick them because they're too small. Oh, okay, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah sadly that plant's been, um, been rubbed out of the base, so that's no longer living. Okay. Yeah, got destroyed. Uh, but yeah, and that was seven years old. That was growing out of Newport. So, yeah, it was just a, one I picked up at a nursery on Speakable for 20 bucks. So it's going to be pretty fast growing. Um, keep them a little bit on the dry side. Yeah. And um, they're pretty hard. Oh, yeah. 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 Before they even got a scroll with my hands. There we go. Oh. Yes, good light, but yeah, it'll tolerate the some shade. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty good. There's another variety called desert lime, which is um, particularly good. That's an Australian native one. Get tiny little fruit like this year, the fruit stayed off the plant. That, that's really lovely. Which is almost. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's flower yet, but yeah. Okay. Okay, so we've got a lot to. There's a lot of. There's a lot of. And they've all got varied history and they're all very, very good for you, so we want to plant them. 
So we haven't signed them in our team comp yet. So we've got to identify roughly the history of, of the individual team, which is really important to know. Because now we've got a better idea how to treat them. Yeah. John, where did you say you plant to the finger line? Where? Where about? Yeah. Um, I, Is that an understory tree? It's an understory tree. I, I use, you can use them outside, you can use them outside in full sun, or you can use them as an understory. Like I've got mine growing, I did have running under the usual tree. Yeah, yeah. Fine. With an orderly sun. Full shade or just sort of broken? Yeah, up, you can it up there. Yeah, yeah just broken. Yeah, and citrus will provide, and it depends on your plant. Mm. So, when we talk about uh, climate, we'll, we'll drill down as far as sun goes. Right? If it's an orange tree, oranges we want them to be sweeter. That's a native desert line. Mm. And they'll tolerate really, as it, lo as it looks like, it'll tolerate very dry conditions. Um, and they, they can actually lose all their leaves and just have the bare stems, and they'll still photosynthesize in the bare stems. Quite well. And they've just, that's, in flowering season, it's completely covered with flower, like every single branch is covered with flower. And then it produces tiny little fruits of that so big. And they're just, they're just, they're like candy, you just eat them. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can see, you also see the big, that's a spine. Oh. <laughs> so yeah. Candles, <laughs> yeah. Because it's not a tree, was that? It is it like a tree? Yeah, like so many plants. I mean, everybody wants the plants to do that. That's not one of them. It isn't going to do that. No matter what you do, it's going to go like that. Right. You're not going to be able to get the kids drawing on one of those. This is not possible. Right. So, if you want a weirdo looking citrus plant, that's your one. Because they are just, but they certainly work well. And I, that that plant there has produced over 200 fruit. Easily. They're only small, but they've been just stacked. Does it take a few years to produce their first fruit? Um, I've had this plant now for, um, this is in its third year now. And originally it was about uh, about that high. So pretty slow growing, but it's just producing and producing and producing. John, what variety of similar one are we just taking? That one is, oh, I'll have to look, I think that's Jude's Everbearer. Yeah, pick it off. Yeah, oranges, of course, we want them to be sweeter. So we need to put more, give them more sun. A, um, a, a lemon, or a lime, or any of those, even a baby glove, will tolerate slightly less sun conditions because we don't need the sugars as much. So they'll tolerate a little bit more shade. All of them want fairly good, if you can give them more sun they'll do better, but they will tolerate more of those sort of conditions. So if you've got only one spot to have a citrus plant and it's full sun, you're going to put your orange there, you're not going to put your lime there. Right. Um, same with mandarins, mandarins would be the same, any of those sort of citrus if you want them to have sweet flesh. So that's a divisor. Alright, water, they all like water to a certain extent, alright, um, typically, yeah, you know, if you analyse the fruit, what's the fruit most like? Yeah. So they, they're pretty tolerant, they need good supply of water to do really well. To get the results you're expecting, you're going to give, give them additional water typically um, over the fruiting period, um, and then they'll, particularly when they're second. Um, now soils is interesting. Um, soils slightly acid, right? Acid neutral, neutral pH. Right? You go, they will tolerate some alkaline soils, but they're better on the acid side. They should be more almost neutral pH in the soil. Um, and overall, they're fairly hungry plants. 
which gets us back to some of the discussion we were talking about with, um, with chickens and those sorts of things. So how are we going to provide the additional nutrients for our citrus if we're not going to go and get some chemical fertilizers and put the chemical fertilizers on? Which is what we used to. I, when I was um, uh, first started in the trade, that's what we did. We had citrus food. You know, and we just put all this chemical fertilizers on it. Did it and they, they grew beautifully. I don't know what to the nutrition. Right? But also if you feed, if you're over, we're not very good at feeding citrus overall. A lot of it's wasted. Right? A lot of it will leak and things like that, particularly your chemical fertilizers. And you can end up getting more pests and diseases if you don't get the fertilizers right. Which is one of the main problems that we get a lot of pests and diseases on these things. Um, so if we're not going to... Um, so what's another way we can fertilise our citrus? Compost. Manures. Manures. Yeah. Right? If I was going to grow my, have my chickens in relation to my citrus plant, would I have them growing, <coughs> would I have the chickens actually growing and getting, um, using, going underneath the citrus? Yeah. Or no. Or would have them <laughs> and separate the citrus and the, and the citrus? Separate. Separate it, yeah. Because even though the cow manure is typically going to be really good for the citrus, they also will tend to dig up the root system of my plant. Uh, because citrus are typically surface rooting initially. All right? And I say that initially. If you have a look at a plant that's 10 years old, um, typically the root system is going to go down about 5 metres into the soil. So they're not just surface rooting at all. Mm. They will go down, anybody who's dug up an old citrus plant, it's a hell of a job. The roots go down quite deep. Right? They can go down up to five metres. But typically early on, they seem to be surface feeding in this little zone. Typically about that far down. Because that's where most of your root mass is going to be. And it will send anchoring roots and things like that down. But are they still feeder roots on the surface? They're still feeder roots on the top. It's sort of pretty much you'll get say 60% of the nutrient intake will be the surface and the remainder will be down the bottom. And uh, typically the water, it will grow up more, bring up water from the base. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Um, how do I know that? Because I've dug enough to dug it up. You know, there used to be a citrus grove over in. Um, in Templestowe, before they put all the houses there, it was citrus groves. Do you hear that? Yeah, massive citrus groves right through Doncaster, all that area, right through there. Yep. Can I, can I use coffee grounds on uh, as a mulch and the citrus? Do you mulch it? Sorry. What was the question? The coffee grounds. Coffee grounds, fine. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Coffee grounds. Uh, of course, what do they contain? Because they nitrogen. Not, yeah, and oh. they got like more acidity in it, like they say, yes, so they it make acid. it more acid. Yeah, yeah they are so. acid, but mainly once they're broken down by the by the soil flora, yeah. they're nutri they're nitrogen, they're basically a nitrogen thing. Okay. Yeah, so your coffee ground is fantastic. Um, any of those sort of waste products will be real good. Um, any manure? Yeah, pretty much any manure you're going to do. We when I was when I started in my trade, we had citrus. I'm so old that we used to, when I first started the trade in the nurse in the nursery trade, our citrus were grown in tins, in actual tins, <laughs> right? Uh, not pots. Pots are new. Plucky pots, they're all new. They were grown in citrus. They don't plastic pots that only just come in. And yes, in they were often in um, in coffee, coffee And so um, yeah, my, it was my job as the apprentice to go around with the fowl manure in a wheelbarrow and fill up the entire pot with your family or right around the top of the pot. Mm. Did that have to be eight? Um, it wasn't. No, <laughs> I can tell you it wasn't that age. <laughs> <laughs> we get a, we get a, uh, yeah, we get the truck, we get the 10 metres of, 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 um, of shit, basically, <laughs> and it'll go there and there was our lunchroom, yeah. right next to it. Yeah. Health and safety, yeah, no, it's not much. Not much in those days at all. So it's not a concern that it might be too um, hot. No, typically not. You put a, we used to put a layer on about that thick. That's not enough to really get enough heat. 
right. and then you water it, and that's fine. Mm. Yeah, if anybody's ever had a mound of cow manure, it can get really hot, but it's the volume. So as long as it's lightly over the top, um, it would be better. And we used to use it straight in the pots. And did those things grow? Oh, I bought the day grow. Mm. So I found manure is really good. Away from the trunk, John? Right? Keep away it away from the front yeah, yeah. Like all, they say that with all citrus, yeah. all right, because they get what's called cholera, cholera. Mm. Um, which is a, a fungal disease. Where you've got your trunk, and at the, at the ground level there, you will, you can, if you hit the mulch up too high, you'll actually get a fungal, uh, form a fungus attack right on that, and it'll just rot right around the front.